Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Uh, excited to be with you here this morning. As you see in the title, Lumberjack Landlord, for those of you who don't know, 137 units and I don't know, 20 something right now, active and counting uh, Section 8 voucher tenants. Uh, and so what I wanted to talk to you guys about this morning, um, because so I did my boot camp last night. For those of you who don't know, I have a course. Um, part of that course is a boot camp. Um, that boot camp is every single week for 12 weeks. We meet for, I say an hour, it's usually two and a half, um, but two and a half hours. We go through everything, everything you can imagine. So we cover the course stuff first, answer any questions you might have on the course stuff, uh, talk about everybody's kind of strategy, what they're doing, answer questions. But then we jump into the topic of the week. What is happening? So you get kind of an exclusive look-see at what I'm going to talk about the next day. But most importantly, we talk about all the goings on and kind of how to manage them. So what I wanted to do with you guys here today is um, it was a lot of feedback last night in the boot camp. And they had said, well, geez, you know, we're not really sure we understand it. And some of them are brand new landlords that have no properties. So they're not even landlords technically yet. Um, they're landlord in mindset. They're getting their mind right before they jump into the game uh, and getting educated, skilling up like I always like to talk about. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is I've seen far too many posts from people saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this. And so this is like one of the simplest things you'll ever see. I want to spend time with you guys this morning, actually taking you through the steps of exactly how I did it. I had a call with them on Friday with Section 8 um, housing, um, and they call them housing authorities or houser, housing uh, choice or voucher choice program or choice voucher program. They call them all sorts of different things. At the end of the day, it's what we all know, Section 8. They want to get away from that moniker for a bunch of different reasons, but I, I know why. I just, I'm not going to talk about it on the channel. So that being said, one of the really interesting things that we're going to talk about is we're going to look at exactly how I do what I do when I try and get more than market rent or more than fair market rent from Section 8. The first place you have to start is create that foundation. What is the foundation? Let's talk about first Section 8 housing. Section 8 housing is essentially they have a voucher program and that can mean based on their income that Section 8 is going to pay anywhere from 40% or 30% of their rent all the way up to 100% of their rent. Now that voucher is worth more in different parts of the country based on where you are and what the quote unquote fair market rent, FMR, and that comes out once a year from the government. They actually produce the number and say, this is what the number is going to be. So without further ado, I'm literally going to take you guys through it step by step. There should be no questions. There should be no confusion. I'm taking you through step by step of exactly what I do and process I follow. So without further ado, I'm actually going to share my screen. I'm sure I have lots of embarrassing things in the background, but don't worry about it. Um, let's see here. Nope. I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pop this out over here. Oh, come on. Give me that. There you go. So I won't be able to see your questions for a time being, but that's okay. I'm not looking for your questions yet. We will cover them. So I'm going to share my screen and here is what you shall see. All right. We are sharing our screen. So you see in this screen right here, this is the wonderfulness that is the, the Google or the Bing. So if we look at this, the thing that I'm looking up, literally step-by-step, HUD.gov. HUD.gov, but I want to get more directly to it, so I'm doing FMR, fair market rent. So I click on this lovely button right here. Here's what's cool. This talks about fair market rents, 40th percentile rents. Look at this right here, 2024, 23, 22, 21, 20. So you have all the historical information. You can even select later years than that. What's really interesting is we go to 2024. It's right here. But it's as simple as clicking on this button. Click here for fiscal year 2024. Now, I'm going to go into my other screen real quick. And I want to see 
somebody give me a town. First one to get, first one to throw it up, I show that town. And yes, there's a couple second delay. So I'll wait for the first person to throw me a town. Because we want this to be interactive and help our people out. And so I'll do a little service announcement. For those of you who think that this is a wrong thing to do, let me tell you this. When you educate landlords about what the cost and process is for Section 8, guess what happens? You get more units. That's what we want to do. We want to promote landlords putting units into the Section 8 housing program. Now, there are a bunch of caveats to that. You can see my rant a couple of weeks ago. You have to do it right. But Clint LeClaire, man, Clint, you crushed it right on it. Oh, and and uh, and Duchess, you're on there too. All right. I saw, hold on one second. Awesome. I saw, um, I saw Clint first. Sorry. We'll do Clint. Um, so we're changing. So let me just get out of the screen. Sorry, guys. I don't have enough real estate. <laughs> All right. So here we go. We're going to go to Peoria, Illinois. So it's literally this simple, guys. Peoria. There you go. Right here. Click on Peoria. Watch this. Select HUD FMR area. It's selected. Here are the numbers. Right? This is what it was in 2023. This is what it is in 2024. Now, so 640 to 680. So $40, $40 increase. Now, 40 bucks isn't a whole lot, but percentage wise, it's a pretty healthy, pretty healthy number. You know, you're talking what, uh, 640. So you're talking 8%, 7%, you're seven ish, seven ish percent. Not bad, 7% increase. Then you look at these one bedrooms, they went from 707 to 756, 896 to 965, 1164 to 1258, 1211 to 1293. This is what your housing authority will approve in almost all likelihood. There are occasions where for some reason they are under market, makes less than no sense under market, meaning under FMR. That might mean that there's a supply demand issue. There might be too much supply. And so they have no trouble filling units. If you're in most parts of the country, that's not true. Most parts of the country is starving for Section 8 housing. Most parts. Okay. So when we look at this number, this is the number that you can request of Section 8. Now, what's really interesting and a lot of things that people don't know is this is how you do that process. So again, we'll we'll start it all over again. I saw that uh, Duchess put in there, was it Colorado Springs? Yeah, cool. We'll do Colorado Springs next. Colorado Springs, again, right here, you type it right here into the Google machine or the big machine. Fair market rents, scroll down, click here for FY 2024 FMRs, click on Z button, and we're going to go to Colorado Springs now. Golly, here we go. Colorado Springs. There we go. Colorado Springs. And we're going to hit the button. Okay. So this is a great example of how fine tooth this can get. Look at Colorado Springs. There are zip codes within Colorado Springs that are extremely expensive. Look at those numbers. Holy Toledo. 8118. Dear heavens. Now, there's also parts that are much less expensive. Right here, 8833. But this is the Colorado Springs. But guys, it's literally this simple, okay? It's literally this simple. If, I mean, you can't ask for any easier than this. So let me transition. So we're talking about this. We're looking up the different towns. It's that easy for you guys to do this. Don't leave the live stream to go do this. Just be patient. I have more to teach you, I promise. So if we look at this number, right, we're saying, hey, those numbers, absolutely unbelievable. Then they say, okay, I want to know how you do it, right? I need to actually understand the process. So I've walked you through the process of this is how you discover them. Now, what's the process for actually getting the rent? People think, Oh, that's right. So the number goes up to that. Cool. Section eight will be contacting me with raising their rent. Guys, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. It's not how it works at all. 
Here's how it actually works. Think of Section 8 being run as a typical government entity, right? Not particularly ahead of the curve, usually behind the curve, and always not knowing all of the policies that are in place. But they get a bucket of money from the feds, a bucket. That bucket pays for all of their people, all of their vouchers, right? But it's not based on, it's not based on the, the FMR of that year for all of those units. Think about that. So they'll have out of five landlords, you'll have five landlords that are priced all differently on their units. You have the super lazy landlord, and that's not a shot at Dion. Dion is up on this stuff. He is toy. So this is all of the other, like the real lazy landlords, the ones that don't do any of the work. They don't watch the numbers. They're just like, eh, I've been charging $1,000 a month for it. It's fine. Even though FMR is 1275 You can never go backwards. You can never go backwards. I wanted to show you guys another thing. This is a sample letter. Oops, I got to minimize it so I can actually read the whole thing. Um, this is a sample letter. And let me tell you, this is one of the worst sample letters I've ever seen in my entire life. The sample letter is horrible. Um, this sample letter gets sent um, I can get more than, so HOA Prez, I can get more than FMR from section eight. And that's what I'm going to teach. So this is a sample letter of something that a landlord wrote back on his form that he got sent, clicks on the link. And this is the excuse stuff that he wrote back. Absolutely silly, right? Absolutely silly. Uh, let's see here. I'll share that. I'll share this horrible letter. All right. You guys see this letter? So here is this letter. Dear landlord, HUD regulations require Section 8 landlords provide information regarding proposed lease renewals and rent increases at least 60 days prior to the commencement of a lease renewal. This is really important. Some states don't require you to actually renew the lease. Some states allow you to get the FMR increase and not actually enter into a new lease. Depending on the tenant, is dependent upon whether or not I'll enter into a new lease or I will just give them a price adjustment saying this is what the new price adjustment is going to be. I, in my course, have a letter that we send. It gives all the particulars and it says, this is what we're going to be doing. This is how much you're currently paying in rent and what your responsibilities are. This is how much it's going to. But in most states, that's only a 30-day process. In some states or some communist areas, um, on the West Coast, um, it's, you know, something crazy like, well, they have to okay it and not get denied and blah, 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 blah. No, in most states that are, you know, thinking a little bit um, and don't have all these ridiculous framework and rules in place that are just absolutely asinine, they actually do something different. They allow you to give 60 days prior to the commencement of a new lease. So if I want to renew this, so if I know what the number is for January 1, some housing authorities will have that take place. Um, and some of those housing authorities will have it take place uh, in, literally in October. Basically, they get approved in September. The housing authority will approve that for October. And what are they trying to do? They know you as a landlord needs to give 60 days notice. So that's A, if you're in lease, you can't do it. You have to wait till the lease is expired. B, if you're out of lease and you're just month to month, you can do it, but you still have to give that 60 days notice and it's basically till the first. So it wouldn't be October one, it wouldn't be November one, it would be December one. So you can get it basically a month early because you know what the number is because I just shared with you what the FMR is. Now, the key to this is you might want to be careful because they might have plenty of units. They might not have any waiting lists. They might not have a shortage. All those things are possible. And the way you find that out is you pick up the phone and you call the housing authority. Don't be lazy. This is a full contact sport. This is the way it goes. You do the work and you get rewarded. You don't do the work and you end up a poor schlub landlord that doesn't take care of your place. You give a bad experience for your tenants and then your rents are low. And then I buy your property or one of the people that follows Lumberjack Landlord buys your property. And we buy it for a discount. We spend some money. We treat our tenant right. We give them a better experience and then we get more money. 
Money is the last thing that happens. You do all the right things first, and then the money shows up. That's how it works. So when we look at this number, right, um, this is something where everybody's talking about, again, you know, he thinks that this is a good idea, right? This is, this, you know, you can check for one year or for two years. Be careful on the two years because in some cases, states that you sign a two-year lease in, they will actually make you get that notarized. If you're a long-distance landlord, that can kind of be a pain in the tail. It can also be a pain in the tail because your tenant, your tenant does not know how to get things notarized. They don't. So what's really interesting is you can propose the rent right here. Okay. So you can propose the rent right here. Now, this, if I ever find out that somebody that watches my channel does this this way, I will, please don't watch my channel or go back and watch every one of my videos because this was horrible. This is weak like circus lemonade horrible. This was determined as follows, rent guideline board increase, 2%. This is something that the that the, the owner put in there. Now, obviously you have to abide by your state rules for rent control and things like that, or, or by the borough or by the county or by the parish, you or by the, um, by the town or by the city. You have to look at all those rules, but you have to get educated. You have to do the work. Talk to other landlords that are doing this, but don't take their word for it. Don't take their word for it. So rent guidelines board increase 2%. Here is the reasoning. I hate this. I have increased the rent in the past, in the past, in the past four years. Due to inflation, this increase is reasonable. Stupid. Stupid. That's a horrible crap reason. That's a garbage reason. Well, you know, inflation. Dumb. 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 Don't do it that way. You guys need to build a rent box. You got to build a rent box. I talk about it in my course. I show you how to build the most extensive rent box there is. And that's why I get over market from, from these places. That's why I get over market from FMR from section eight. Now everyone's like, oh, FMR is the max. Wrong. Well, the most you can get is FMR. Wrong. Still wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Wrong. Still wrong. I get over FMR all the time because in my market, and this isn't for every single market, but for my market, that's what I understand. That's what I know. That's what I teach. For my market, when we look at those numbers, right, they actually say that FMR in my market for a two-bedroom is, was, or was $2,100, or excuse me, was, was $1,900. For a three-bedroom, $1,900. Three-bedroom, $1,900. I rent those out to the market for $2,200. So I call housing and I say, I've got a unit that I would love that I've seen a lot of people requesting on my ad. If I take section eight, I'm willing to put this in the program and go through the process, but I want to make sure that you know that my rent is 2,200 and they say, nope, it's 1,900. I'm not going to go to 1,900. And I say, but your job is to get units into your program right? That's their job. They need to get units and they need to get people housed. So what do I do? I say, I'm willing to work with you. Again, I can get 2,200 on the market, but maybe it takes longer. Maybe I don't want hundred percent of my units being market units. I actually want to help the affordable housing program and problems. I want to help that. So I'm willing to take a little bit less for the unit for the guaranteed income, but also to help out the program because I want diversification in my portfolio, but naturally I want to help people get into some nice housing. So what I do is I go back to them and say, market's 2,200, you have you're willing to pay 19. I'm willing to go to 21. And they come back and they say, we can do 2,000. Say, I'm not gonna go to 2,000. But I might split the difference with them again and say, all right, I'll do 2,075 or 2,050. You can actually negotiate with them that way. Now, maybe California, you can't negotiate that way, but there's reason 9,742 why you shouldn't be living in California. So I negotiate with my housing authorities. I do this in four different towns. I've never had an issue. Sometimes they've said, we just can't get to that number. Now, if they say they can't get to that number, that's fine. I get it. You can't get to the number, whatever, fine. And I'll just go to back to market with it. And then I'll let them know, hey, this unit isn't Section 8 approved. They've already told me that they're not going to approve this for Section 8. That's simple. 
Some areas have more money than they do units and they are willing to overpay. There's something called an FMR override. It can be 110% of FMR. It can be 120% of FMR. Yep. There's even some areas that are 140% of FMR. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? But this is the process. You don't write a dumb letter like this. This is stupid. You write it based on your rent box. If you have other units or build out. So I actually point to my own units. I have one in that building that rents for $16.95 and you want to pay me $13. As an example on a one bedroom. Take them through the steps. Do the work for them so they can justify this for management on their side. That is the goal. That is what you're trying to accomplish. You have to put yourself in a position where you are educating them because they're not out there shopping for units. They're letting their people, the people of voucher holders, shop for units. And they keep on bringing stuff back and go, what about this one? 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 Not the most efficient way to do it. That's why we as landlords, good landlords, need to be proactive. We need to go to housing and say, I have this unit available. I've gotten a number of requests from Section 8 tenants. I need to understand what it is that you'd be able to approve because I'm at 2200 bucks. Sometimes I played hardball. You know, a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom with nothing included, blah, 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 was like $1,750. They said, great, we've approved it. $1,750, that's all we're going to pay. Nope, no thanks. Well, that's the best we can pay. We'll approve that. No, it's not approved. I'm not giving you the unit. And they said, you can have it for $1,950, period, end of story, nothing included. And it took, she's like, well, I can't approve that. I said, that's fine. No problem. Get to somebody that can approve it. You have 48 hours. Literally, I said that. 48 hours later, they sent it back. We approve. We will sign that lease. What was FMR? 1750. What did I get? 1950. That's exactly the process that I used to get it. Be respectful, but have facts, not stupid feelings like this. This is crap. Give them the reason. Do the work for them. Show them the numbers. Show them the numbers. When I build up my rent box, I know my stuff, but I'm also looking at the market so that I can see what they're doing. You build that out, and there is no doubt in my mind, literally a majority of the country, you're going to get above FMR approved in a majority of the country. There are always outliers. And quite frankly, if your, you, if your area, if your Section 8 authority isn't paying market, I wouldn't want to be renting in that, in that market. Because I use Section 8 as the bottom, as a baseline. I know that at a minimum, I can get this for rent. And it's because I know all of my markets around me, all of them, they actually pay at least FMR. And in most cases, I can get them above FMR because I can show them I'm willing to give you this unit, but this is what it looks like. So that is a crash course in how to get your highest rents through the voucher program and ensure that you're diversifying your portfolio, but also making sure that you're helping the affordability issue. And for those people that are out there and say, that's just disgusting, you're taking more money, go away. You clearly don't own a business. You clearly don't own anything in all likelihood. And I really don't care about your opinion. Your opinion didn't make me, so it sure as hell ain't gonna break me. So when I look at that, I say, landlords, it's our job to reach out to our community and be a part of the solution. At the end of the day, I'm not saying that you have to take less than market rent and just live with it. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying that is if you can create a mutually beneficial relationship with housing, try to do that. It helps you diversify, but it also helps get people into an affordable home that they might not otherwise be able to get into. So as I always say, we try and create great content for you. Please make sure you hit that like button. I'm going to stop sharing now, and then we'll get into all your, what I'm sure will be amazing questions. So let's do this. Why are there only 17 likes? That is unfortunate. Okay. So here we go. First again, Dividend Dave. There you go, Dividend Dave. First again. Ah, so good. 
Oh, it's so good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Joshua Melby, good morning, Matt. Going to be replacing two toilets in the new house hack. Congratulations with Viper toilets, round or elongated. Me particularly, I actually like the uh, the round because in a lot of bathrooms, especially in older homes, there's not as much move around space. So sometimes getting out of the shower, if you have an elongated toilet, you're giving up another five or six inches. Oh, I need that. I need that space. I want to make it more spacious and I can do that with a rounder bowl. They're not a tiny round bowl. They're a big round bowl, but they're still round. Better, better product in my eyes. Uh, Invest to Wealth. Good morning, Richard Gamino. Good morning, sir. Busy uh, Basilio. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you back. Greetings from Orlando. There's my buddy Dion. Stay tuned to Dion's channel on Tuesday. He's going to be giving his slant on this as well. Well worth attending. Uh, Clint LeClaire. Good morning, sir. Good to see you back. Christopher R., you made it. Yes, you did. Duchess. Hello, sir. Uh, Robert Farinelli. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Hello, Duchess. Robert Farinelli, hello, sir. Good morning, Matt. Made it again. Good to have you here. Uh, favorite two things on a Sunday, catch Lumberjack Landlord live stream. And number two, uh, make fun of adventure consulting videos. <laughs> I haven't watched a video of his in, in almost a year. The only thing I get are his shorts in my feed. I hate that. Thumbs down. <laughs> um, let's see. Josh Burdick, good morning, bearded ombre. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Clint LeClaire, the best compliment a new tenant gave after taking this uh, course boot camp was, wow, you're super organized. This place must run without you if it's put together as well as your onboarding packet. Yeah, my man. Good for you, Clint LeCare. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good for you. I'm telling you, you guys can dial this in. You can give a better experience than any other landlord out there. I know I'm an operator and I crush. So I share all of those secrets with you guys in the course. And we talk about them live with other landlords in the boot camp. 24 hours more. Of, of training and talking through real scenario stuff. You guys are missing out. Uh, Duchess fund fun, although RC may be needing funds. Yeah. Chris Culp, good morning. Good morning, sir. Chris was in our, our boot camp last night. We had a blast. Uh, two and a half hours of fun. Uh, Laura Samaniu, good morning. Robert Fernelli, Section 8 in Nashua uh, gave an automatic override without asking at 2600 when the limit was 2473. And very often you do have to ask for it, but sometimes they reek of desperation. But if they will automatically give you 26, you can probably get more. Just saying. Um, let's see. We did Colorado Springs. We did Peoria. Robert Finale. Section 8 in Nashua gave that override. Yes. Spirited MB. I love your content. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Have a strong visceral feeling that you do not, especially now, trust the government. Yeah, why would I? <laughs> for the government, we're here to help. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had far too much involvement with them and no otherwise. Uh, what if they pull it all on you at once? And they will. Uh, too good to be true. I'm out. No. Pull what? Make a bunch of people homeless all at once? Like, that's the bear, right? So the government coming after people is the bear. Well, if that's the case, then I don't need to outrun. Every, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. And I'll outrun you because I'm a better operator. That's the idea, guys, is that I know the more people that take my course and do the boot camp, the more people that do that, guess what? The more people that become elite. And then it's not a matter of beating the government. It's a matter of beating the other landlord. That's it. That's it. Right? That's what it comes down to. Think about that. Does Jordan think about beating the refs? Do you think about beating David Stern? No, no. He just had to outplay the guy in front of him. That's it. That's what this is, guys. It's no more difficult than that. Um, Chris Culp, Lancaster, PA. Oh, we already did Lancaster, PA. Florence, Alabama. We, uh, You guys know how to do it. We'll show you guys how to do it. Or we showed you how to do it, so now you guys can do it. Uh, Robert Fernandez, still trying to understand why Keene went down when there is such a shortage, but Keene technically uses the CHE. Yeah, county rents. That's why they went down. The issue though, and you'll typically see it in one year, they will have trouble filling units 
and then they will go back and they'll get approved and override. That's literally what will happen. Yep. That's what will happen. You can almost count on it. HOA praise. If you can get some, if you can get more than FMR, you won't use section eight. Not true. Like I said, just proved it. I just proved I get over FMR and I don't do it in one market. I don't do it in two. I don't do it in three. I do it in four, four markets, four markets. I get more, I get more than FMR. Just needed to see what the skill was, know that it was possible. And that's what I'm here for. Um, HOA Prez, uh, you probably have a couple of years of FMR increase uh, since they are moving average. Of course, it is it is location dependent. So it is location dependent and it is moving average, but it's two years back. So the numbers that they're using to calculate FMR for, for 2024 were 2017 through 2021. So 2021 was an increase in rents. 2022 was a massive increase in rents. And 2023 was still an increase in rents. So I've predicted we're going to see an average of over 10% in the next two years. So I believe in the next two years, Section 8 will likely be 10% and then 10% higher. Again, kind of across the board from an average perspective, but that's going to be higher in some areas. In my area, I got 30% this year in FMR. 30 30%. I predicted I predicted it would be way up. I was right. Now, next year when that happens, are we going to be down? Nope. Are we going to be flat? No. Will we go up 3, 4, 5, 6%? Yeah, maybe, probably, in all likelihood. And then we'll be up the next year as well. So it might average 10 or 12% over three years. What do I care? They're getting closer and closer and closer to market. I'm able to diversify my portfolio. I'm able to help out affordable housing. Guys, and at the end, I've put more people through from the from the housing authority. I've got more of those folks in my units, but I've got quality people in my units. They have to live to the same standard that the market tenants do. Oh, that's good. Sorry, I had to take a drink. Um, Matt Bittner. What's an example of one of your Section 8 rental increases? What was the rent before and what is the rent after the increase? Matt Bittner, if you take a look at, um, we actually went through that exercise. So we showed 2023 and 2024. So if you just watch the beginning of the video, you'll actually see what 2023 was. It lists it right below. And then 2024, it shows that on the total on the top. Uh, Robert Farinelli, what deductible uh, do you recommend for someone with three units working with uh, Archer to save money thinking of $10,000 same as an emergency fund? So when it comes to insurance deductibles, it really has to be what you feel comfortable with. Um, for me, I don't self-insure, but I do a happy, heavy medium. What I mean by that is if I paid for a $2,000 deductible on all my rental properties, if I paid for a $2,000 deductible on all my rental properties, my insurance would probably be about 150 grand a year. I have a $20,000 deductible on all of my properties because I can get most of the work done and I can get it done for far cheaper than the insurance company is going to pay out. And I don't want the claim going unless it's really catastrophic. I, only for me, my example is for myself, I do it in a way that essentially, because I can do a roof for you know, 10,000 instead of 20,000. And I know that if I file a claim for a silly roof at 10,000 bucks and I have 137 units, what's the likelihood that my premium is going to go up? It's absolutely going to go up, right? Because of that, I really use insurance for what it's meant for, catastrophic. So if we get a tornado through New Hampshire, or we get a hurricane through New Hampshire, or we get a blizzard through New Hampshire that, you know, brings 17 feet to the ground, uh, and on roofs and things start collapsing, I'm covered. Now, the difference is at my twenty or twenty-five thousand dollar deductible, my insurance is like ninety thousand dollars a year, so I save sixty thousand dollars a year. Well, that sixty thousand bucks, as you can, you can imagine, it goes to all sorts of other improvements and things like that. Now, if I got hit with eight houses being destroyed, right, I would have to come up with, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. Right now, even though I might have to come up with that two hundred thousand dollars, I might not have to come up with that two hundred thousand dollars. I could take the insurance money and then just sell the land. Right, all legal, going through that process. I'm not trying to deceive anyone and say, "Aha, I'm building," and then do something else. That's literally the process that I will go through. All right, going to skip ahead to my good buddy Dion. Uh, there are three reasons rents are going to go up. It's going to suck owing rentals. Money is heavy. 
you know what? Money is heavy. I counted quarters last night. I wanted to, I, you guys actually saw it. I post on Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, why are you not trying? I post things there every single day that is a life and a landlord. If you want to understand what it's like to own a big, huge, massive portfolio, there's good things and there's bad things in there. I show them all. And so yesterday was a fun day. Yesterday, I got to collect six weeks worth of quarters out of some laundry machines that I put into one of my, one of my buildings. And it was like $527. And I made it a game with my kids, literally made it a game, like putting them in the feeder and putting them in the packages and all that stuff. It was fun for like an hour. And so we did that, but it was $527 and my cost. So I look at it as my cost per wash. My cost per wash and dry is around two and a quarter, 250, right around there per wash and dry. And the cost on those machines is like six or six and a quarter. So I, every single time somebody does a load in my uh, washing machine and dryer, I make about, you know, three fifty four 4 bucks. And that's pretty cool. All right, back to where we were. Uh, let's see. So that's what I would do. So Robert, that's what, I, that's what I've done when it comes to insurance. You have to pick your own number. So I always am doing cost basis too, right? If I look at 20,000, and that 20,000 saves me, you know, the deductible, that 20,000 saves me 60,000 bucks a year, but a $10,000 deductible saves me uh, $20,000 a year, then it's easy. I go with the, I go with the, um, the bigger one, you know, it's really just cost benefit analysis. That's really what it is. Um, Buzztune, good morning. Good morning, Buzztune. Invest well. Thank you, Matt. This is very helpful. I'm glad that's exactly what I was going for. HOA Prez, be aware of your state laws. Thanks to California Tenant Protection Act, uh, aka Landlord Destruction Act, no one needs just cause to evict. Act one ne needs just cause. Yeah. Act Destruction Act, one needs just cause to evict. Yeah, absolutely. But you don't have to evict. You can raise rents. I mean, there are rules for rent raising, but if you're in a market, you better know those rules. And I'm not taking the time to learn California rules because I'll never invest there. Not in a gajillion years, maybe sooner. Uh, HOA Prez, uh, but the one reason to live in California is the capital appreciation for real estate is amazing. You may not have possible ca positive cash flow, uh, which can be the big problem. Yeah, but if I can't get positive cash flow, I don't give a crap about appreciation. Don't care. There's plenty of places around the country where you've gotten bigger appreciation than you have in California. There's tons of them, tons of them. California does not have a monopoly on appreciation. And the bigger thing to be concerned about is uh, people could not get out of that state faster. So migration patterns are real. And while they might not be real right now, i.e. you're feeling all of the effects of it, when all the really rich mobile people no longer want to deal with that state, guess what? They're not going to be there. And you're, they're going to have to find a way to make taxes on all of you people. All of the people that weren't so rich that they could be mobile and jet. And so that leaves the people left behind, which might be the rich, but not the uber wealthy. You, you enjoy paying 13.9% in that top bracket? No, you're paying 54%. When it's all said and done, you're paying 54% of your money to taxes. Enjoy working until the end of July for free. No way. No way. Just math for me, guys. Um, HOA Prez. Yep. A lot does depend on the PHA. That's what I talked about two weeks ago is section eight generally as a program is pretty horrible. However, if you have a good PHA, uh, a housing authority, if you have a good housing authority that can make all the difference in the world. And the only way that you know that is by giving them a unit and seeing what that experience is. You know, if they held the town, a tenant accountable, like you try to hold them accountable. If they're not constantly calling you with, you're the problem, you're the problem, you're the problem. And every single time something gets reported, you're just a bad landlord, right? I had one of those. I stopped doing business with them. And I told them as such, I said, Hey, is this guy still doing your inspections? They're like, yep. I said, cool. Like, did you have any other questions? Nope. No more. Do you have any units for us? Nope. Not one. Not one. Nope. Mm -mm. People can apply and if they qualify and they're the best option, sure. I'm, I, I, I'm fair. However, when I have my choice of other people, which I do for every one of my units, certainly not going to pick you. Not going to, because there's other housing authorities that will pay the same amount that are better. Why would I deal with your crap? 
I'm not interested. Um, HOA Prez, make sure you uh, qualify Section 8 applicant as like any other rental applicant. Yeah. So this is a silly concept too. Make sure you qualify them like you would any other, ca any other applicant. Most Section 8 people, most, most Section 8 people, I've seen all the numbers, most Section 8 people don't qualify. They don't have a 680 credit score. They don't make three times the rent. Most of them don't qualify. So it makes it really easy. Now you can have other rules. You're still allowed to set those rules, except for maybe California. But in my state, I can set the rules. I want a 680 credit score. I want 3x rent. Um, I want uh, you know stubs showing that they paid their portion of their rent to their landlord if they owe a portion to it. So it's obviously all of those processes, obviously all of those ideas, right? We have to, we don't treat them any differently, but we certainly can't treat them special either. Way it goes. Chris Culp, Matt. Yes, Chris. Manuel Castel Castellanos. I hope I said that right. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Happy to. Brett Bisboer. Bisboer. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Chris Culp, Matt, do you have a, a national view on what the security of Section 8 is worth? Uh, no, it's subjective question, but would like your thoughts. Um, I don't, I know, um, I, I had that somewhere too. I looked, I, I went through all the work of putting that together in 2021 or two, 2021 or 2022. I put together all that work. Um, all I know is that, um, we went from like 2 million vouchers nationally to, I think now we're over 2.4 million vouchers nationally. It's a big number. <clears throat> it's a big number. But you have places that literally, I don't know what the lowest is, but I think I've seen an efficiency through HOA. I want to say the number was like 350 or 380 bucks. Obviously, it's, you know, middle of nowhere, you know, some depressed area. Um, so I've seen it like 300 and something bucks. And then I've seen uh, four bedrooms. I've seen four bedrooms over 5,000 bucks. Um, rich, uh, was it Richmond? I think it was Richmond, Virginia was one. Um, there were a couple of others. There were a couple of others that were absolutely through the roof. They were like five, six grand. It was crazy. Uh, Chris Culp, elongated ADA height Viper toilets, Rick. So you can go with the elongated. Like I said, depending on those old houses, there can be a challenge. I like to do the round bowls. If it's a smaller, tighter bathroom, if it's one of those big ones. Yeah. And space is an issue. Go for the gusto. Uh, HOA press, uh, compare to a bad tenant, a vacancy is a delight. Uh, don't lower your tenant approval standards. Yep. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Robert Farinelli, uh, for the Nashua housing authority, I just said 2650, even though FMI was 2473, they came back with 2600. looks like they need units. That's the case for almost every single authority. Farinelli, he learned that in the lumberjack landlord course. We talk about that all the time. He's crushing it he would have gotten less money for that unit. Now he's getting a couple hundred bucks more a month for that unit. It's a win. Um, if uh, HOA Prez, if you are a new landlord, then simply avoid governments that don't like landlords. Yeah, that's, that's, that goes without saying. You guys hear me say it all the time. I had the choice to invest in Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, or Maine. Vermont was pretty much immediately out because you know. Uh, Massachusetts and Maine, they went out quickly as I talked to other landlords and they're just like, yeah, it can be a challenge. Yeah. You know, you can't evict in the winter time, you know, four months during the winter time, you can't evict. And I'm like, yeah, we're not playing that stupid game. If you're not paying rent, get out. If you are paying rent, you're welcome to stay. Um, and in New Hampshire, they are aligned, excuse me, in New Hampshire, they're aligned with landlords. They know that if the landlord is not getting paid rent, he can't pay his property tax. And property tax is one of the main drivers in this state for how we fund government. So that's a big thing. Uh, Courtney McNeil. Hi, Courtney McNeil. Uh, the FMR for a four bedroom in my area in 2023 is 2998. In my area, they take out, they take some out for utilities. So I'm currently approved to get 2356. Is this normal to take that much out for utilities? Not typically. That seems way too high. That is way too high. 
way too high. Ask them, okay, every single, that's a great point, Courtney. Thank you for doing that. Ask them for their breakdown of utilities include exclude list. They have a list. They will show it to you. If you ask for it, they don't share it otherwise. But say, I need to get a copy of the payment standard with the breakdowns. Because for me, on a four bedroom, the credit, if it's oil heat, right? And this is in the Northeast. So we're $29.97. And the credit for oil heat and all the other utilities is like 510 bucks a month. So it's 2,400 and change. Um, and so in that, uh, in looking at that, you can run the numbers. Now you can do things like you can put a thermostat in that only goes to 70 degrees, right? Um, you can do things like that. So long as the, the building is kept to a temperature of above 58 degrees for more, for, and doesn't go below 58 degrees for more than eight hours, you're okay. Otherwise you're going to have a big problem on your hands. Now, I would obviously never say it has to stay at 58 degrees. That's silliness. But we also see on when it's zero outside, people trying to put it on 78. Like, don't be a jerk. Like, that's not, that's, it's not an accelerator. That's not how heat systems work. It's not an accelerator. That's just the duration of which it's going to run until it gets to that temp. It's not, oh, I'm going to turn on my super burners. That's not how heat systems work. So that's a great point, Courtney. What I would do is, is I would ask them for the detail list. When you get that detail list, you'll be able to dissect it piece by piece. Why are there 54 people watching and I only have 30 likes? Please, please, people. Uh, Leela. Hi, Leela. Uh, I learned about this HUD table from you about six months ago. Awesome. Found out my Section 8 rent is too low. Awesome. About 400 bucks. Can I ask for that much of an increase? Depends on the inspection. The inspection is something where they start grading units. And if they grade a unit and you don't agree, just say, I'm not going to put it in there for that. If you guys want to grade it, they grade it on a scale of like 110 to like 350. Some inspectors depend on that. Other inspectors don't. And if the best part is, is that you can say, I'm not going to agree to that rent. You don't have to. You don't have, you're not forced to agree to the rent package that they want to do. But that's why I do it beforehand, because then it becomes about the unit and not about the person, right? So while I want the unit to get approved by section eight, and the way that I do that is going through inspection and then agreeing on what I can, you know, what they would be willing to pay for that unit, that number can also fluctuate depending on who the applicant is. You know, we had somebody that was approved for 2200 and then they lost their job and they were approved for 1940. And I said, I'm not doing the unit for 1940. They said, then he can't take the unit. I said, then that's fine. That's up to you guys. I'm not making that decision. We agreed on 2200. You're saying now 1940. Nope. No take backsies. Sorry. I know that you think we're real close, but I'm not giving you $3,000 a year. Nope. Uh-uh. I'll go market. Thanks. So you don't have to take it. Yeah. So um, you, you can't just demand any increase. Look up the FMR and then understand, do a rent box and understand what the other ones are going for. You need to be more educated than the housing specialist, guys. You have to do more work than the housing specialist. If you have a rent box, you can say, I'm a landlord and I own six units and here's all their rents, right? You could do that. Or you can do a rent box and say, guys, I've done the market research. I have units that fit at this. I My units are at this. The market units are at this. You're $250 too low. So if we can work together and get closer to the number, I'm happy to go this route. However, if we're not, then this is a done conversation. I don't have to rent to you. I don't have to take less money. I don't. I don't. Um, HOA press, make sure that you are aware uh, that as a Section 8 landlord that you are subject to federal laws that neither the tenant or landlord can change. It's not a big deal, but be aware. Yeah. I mean, it's in the HAP contract. You guys all have to sign a HAP contract when you are um, uh, when you sign up a Section 8 tenant. So you just have to abide by those rules. Nothing crazy. Ask your PHA if they will pay for tenant damages and or eviction costs. The worst that can happen is they say no. They very, very rare, very rare that they would, that they pay for those things because the, the contract is, is section eight is facilitating the contract. But at the end of the day, they don't lay claim to that tenant. They still say, well, it's at your discretion, Mr. Landlord. Yeah, you're right. That's why I said no. 
HOA Prez, uh, you have a captive tenant as once a tenant. Not true. Um, I, yeah, I just disagree with that. It's not true. I, I, I don't always renew those tenants. I don't. I don't always renew those tenants. There's no reason to. I look at what the market is and I look at what I'm getting for rent and I work with housing, but they're not a captive tenant. I just had one move out. And I was thrilled to see her go because I, I did none of the things. She was ridiculous. I didn't want to do any of the things that she asked for. None of them were life safety issues. The inspector said that. Excuse me. The city inspector that she called on me said that. He goes, those aren't life safety issues. And then the inspector for Section 8, what did he do? All of these issues need to be taken care of. F off. No, not doing it. Not doing it. She's a pill. She can leave. That was it. I told housing. I said, I'm not doing those things. I said, so that's fine. They said, well, we'll have to break the HAP contract. Fine. Cool. No problem. It's going to be, I'll get, I'll get more money from the market anyway. Not an issue. And the worst thing was, is that I then exposed her because she was getting a four bedroom unit and I didn't realize that she'd lost her older kids. So I said to housing, I said, you do realize you're paying for a four bedroom unit. And she only has three kids, right? Or she only has two kids. Yeah, she doesn't deserve a four bedroom voucher. Make sure that goes to somebody that can. So this other landlord that did no work was stupid. Didn't call me for a reference. Didn't get any proof of her of payment because she didn't pay the last three months. All he did was listen to the gripe about how I'm a horrible landlord. Dude, you deserve it. Good luck. Good luck dealing with that dumpster fire of a tenant. She sucks. Um, I would have helped her pack. She then harassed me after I let her leave early with no penalty. She then harassed me about her, about her deposit. For four weeks, she sent me an email every four to six days. I didn't, and I wasn't going to answer. And you know what she just got? She just got a bill for 5,000 bucks. And now I'm going to follow up on it. And if she doesn't pay, she'll lose her voucher because she sucked. She ruined the place. She created a rat problem. This was that same tenant. So you'll get some of those, but this was an inherited Section 8 tenant. Couldn't be more happy that she's gone. She got in a fight with every single neighbor in the neighborhood. They all but had a parade the day she left. And you know what? She ended up in exactly the town that she should have, which is one of the worst areas in our entire state. Thrilled for her. But that other landlord, stupid. That other landlord, it's going to cost them thousands of dollars. Um, let's see, Basilio, uh, would you, uh, HOA Prez, um, it is a miracle, but I saw a, uh, I saw a section eight applicant with an 800 score. Dion has a section eight tenant with an 800 credit score. It's possible. It's possible, but I can tell you, I've seen 200 applications in the last 24 months and I've seen six with a 700 credit score. Five out of the six live with us. Five out of the six we took, but one, I was just like, I don't, I don't care if their credit score is 9,000. I thought they were assholes. And because we have so many people apply, it's not like I'm discriminating when I say no to them. I get to choose the best apple in the bunch. I don't have to pick the one that is, you know, skin's broken and is all bruised up. I don't have to pick that one. I can pick the best one when they present me with 10 apples. I pick the best of the 10 apples. Way it goes. It's my right to do so. Um, Basilio, uh, would you cash out refi right now at seven or eight percent if you are low in capital to buy your next rental? Um, the only way that I would do that is if, for me, I've done that. I've done that in the past. Um, but the only time that I would do that sort of stuff is um, the first thing I would look at is I would look at getting a HELOC against the property and paying a higher amount on that HELOC. I would look at that. Uh, but then I want to make sure that I still cash flow, right? I still have to cash flow and I still have to cash flow well. Um, but that's usually how I would do it. Um, I don't know that I'd give up three and a half or 4% debt for seven or 8% debt. Um, that is recycling capital, but it's pretty aggressive. So what I would do is, is I would look at maybe a HELOC through like a convoy or somebody like that um, and not refinance the cheap debt, but just add on other expensive debt. That's likely what I'd go look at. 
Um, HOA Prez, a good Section 8 tenancy lasts for years as the tenant has a good deal and is not likely to move. It's sometimes, yeah. I mean, I've got 20 something of the units and some of them have renewed, but what we usually find is, is that when we find that a tenant becomes obnoxious or is difficult to deal with or, you know, is becomes demanding and, you know, asking for things to be fixed is not demanding, but I have somebody that's like, you know what, this, this cabinet, this cabinet, I, I, I you know, it got wet once and I can just tell I'm not changing out a $300 cabinet. Cause you can tell you're a jerk. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing functionally wrong with that, with that. And it was that way when you moved in, I'm not changing it. No, I ain't doing it. Um, let's see. Get your local PHA administrator procedure manual as it can be useful. Sometimes you can get those. Sometimes you can't. Um, and they usually don't know them as well as you do. You're better off um, doing what other landlords are doing, seeing what they did to be successful, getting something approved. You know, the, a lot of that manual can be interpretation. And so I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in giving them facts, which are, this is what it rents for. Um, and if you want it, great. If you don't, that's fine too. And then you can also find the people that are willing to work with you, right? If they're willing to work with me, I, I want to be part of the solution. I want to be part of the problem. But if you're not willing to work with me, then you're part of the problem. You're the issue. Um, one second. A tenant, uh, not one of my tenants, a neighbor tried to throw guys off of a job site because they said they can't work on Sundays. Wrong. <laughs> Idiots. They can absolutely work on Sundays. It's during daylight hours. Morons. Um, let's see. REI Stoners, last. Not last. There's still more people that are going to join. Uh, REI Stoners, you may be first, Dave, but I already got trash picked up around the property and painted a hall and living room today. Good for you. Very productive. Um, HOA Prez, my local PHA actually will assist landlords with eviction costs. Granted, this is likely to be extremely rare. That's super rare. Yeah, I wouldn't bank on that at all. Robert Finley, National Housing Authority is okay so far. They wait until the last minute for getting a tenant in place, but then they are super responsive. Inspectors seem good too, flagged a few dumb things. So that's good. That's good. And you start to, and here's the thing, you start to learn what those things are going to be. We failed every single Section 8 inspection, literally every single one, the first dozen that we had. Every one we failed. And it was, and we got, it got less and less and less and less and less. And it was always stupid little things, you know? And that's where I also, if the guy's like, yeah, I'm not going to, that's not a life safety issue. I'm not going to stop them from moving in, but please just send me confirmation that that's been taken care of. And so that's where we talk about it. We do the same thing with code enforcement. If it's one of those things, it's just like, yeah, we want to see this moved or this taken care of or this done, blah, blah, blah. It's easy, easy to take care of. Um, Aria Centers, how do you get grease stains off of concrete patio slab? Um, you can actually have it power, power washed, um, but have the one that does like a heated washer and detergent. Um, but I've never been successful in getting it perfectly clean myself. Um, and then it looks uneven, the spot that you clean versus the ones that you don't. So you can actually hire those people. They can come by. They're not too expensive um, because they can do the entire job pretty quickly in all, in all, like in all usuality, in all eventuality. Yes. Um, buzz to, nope, sorry. Uh, Robert Finelli, but the inspector allowed photos and got everything corrected in less than a day. Exactly right. I actually have one of my uh, PMs there. Um, I have one of my PMs there uh, purposefully. And we literally talk about it right there in front of me. I said, okay, sounds good. So this is the list. They go, yep, that's the list. Okay, great. If you can just not write the report before the end of the day, we'll get that stuff wrapped up today. If we can, we'll get that stuff wrapped up today and then I'll send it all to you. And that way you've got a good report, nice and clean. And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, sure. I can wait a day to do the report. Awesome. Or they say, nope, I got to write one and fail it, but then you can send me the stuff and I can attach it saying not failed. Okay. Whatever's easier for you. If I can try and save you from doing work. 
I don't care if I fail and then pass because it shows that I'm doing the work. Uh, but I try and save them effort and energy if I possibly can. Uh, Buzztune, uh, for Roth IRA, is it true you can withdraw your contributions uh, penalty-free? Trying to access more capital? Thanks. Buzztune, you got to talk to a CPA and an EA. So I know that you can. I know that there's some rules around it, but that's where um, I don't give that kind of advice because I still pay for that advisement from my EA and my CPA. I still pay them for that. We have a conversation every 90 days where we go through it and we talk about, hey, this is where we're headed. This is the, some of the stuff that we're thinking about. This is what we need to put together. So I still have that conversation. Yep. Um, Aria Sonners, how do you bill a tenant for stuff if their deposit gets depleted? You have to send them, like I show in my course, um, there's that letter, which is the security deposit letter. We show that security deposit letter. We show here's where everything that was spent. We certainly can provide receipts if you'd like. We obviously have pictures. Um, and then I send that when we send that to them. Um, if it's more than what their deposit was, we let them know this all here's everything that totaled. Here's what you had for deposit. We credited the deposit towards that bill. Um, and here's what's above and beyond that you still owe. Please remit payment to. We do the assumptive close. Please remit payment to this address. Um, if not, we will continue to pursue legally. That's what we say. And it works, works great. Um, and that's the process. That's the process. Uh, let's see. HOA Press, uh, check with your county as at least my county housing department is flush with cash. Yep, we have people on call, so-called rapid rehousing for two years of free rent. Yeah, there are definitely, that's what I'm saying. What HOA Press is saying is absolutely far more the case than places paying under FMR. You know, I talk about it in some of the chat rooms that I'm in. And they're just like, no, it's under FMR. I'm like, then you're an idiot for investing in that area. If you did all that homework and you knew it was lower than FMR, you're, you're a dope for investing in that area. Wouldn't have done it. That's dumb. That's dumb. Ironwood Workman. Dang, I missed most of the show. That's all right, Ironwood. You're here now. Good to have you. Uh, Leo Kiros, Buzztune, true. Yes. Like I said, true with some caveats. Make sure you meet with a, you know, even maybe a financial advisor, but definitely a CPA and an EA because you want to make sure you structure it properly before it happens. Uh, HOA press depends. You can't do construction work in my city on Sunday. Just check your local laws. Yeah, that's very few places. Welcome to California. It's not like that in most of the country. Most of the country rewards hard work and side hustlers. There's different hours during the week, but on the weekends, there's no, there's, there's no, they can't stop you from doing work. They can't, not legal. Nope. Hey, G Lover. What's up, G Lover? It's I'll always stick with you, Glover. Always. Um, I'm working, was looking at property in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Very cool. HOA depends. Oh no, I already did that one. I, REI Stoners, post office won't deliver mail because they want our boxes moved next door near the neighbors. Contact the neighbors, owners, and they agreed. Ever dealt with moving a mailbox? Yep. Literally last week. I actually called and I said, hey, I, and when you usually get the person that answers, you just ask for the postmaster. Um, and talk to them. And I said, I'd like to put these in a, you know, not visible from the street because I want to make sure that I can give the mail person a break from the bad weather. So we've got a hallway for the building. Can I put them in there just so they can get a break? Like if it's freezing cold, if it's, you know, if it's pouring rain, can we just put them inside so we can give them a break? Again, bringing a solution. They were like, really? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Got them ordered, but I didn't want to put them outside if I could get away with putting them on the inside and give her a break. So like, that'd be, and she was like, she literally got called into the office and she's like, thank you so much for doing that. Hey, no problem. Happy to, happy to do things that make everyone's life easier. We like putting them inside because guess what? Now I'm not going to have to listen to complaints about things getting stolen. Much better spot, right? Um, REI Stoners, post office won't deliver mail. Nope, already did that one. Ironwood Workman, could uh, could stain the driveway if you really need to make it look clean. Yet most people just want to make them uh, safe, slip free. True. Robert Fernandez, the worst area Matt mentioned was probably Summersworth, maybe Rochester. What's the worst? What, what worst area? What's that mean? Um, I don't invest in one of those. I do invest in the other one. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean by worst area. I can promise you this. I've been to Manchester. 
there's not much worse than that. And I've been to plenty of parts of Nashua. There's not much worse than that. There's parts of that city that should literally get leveled. Uh, G Lobo, Section 8 rents jumped from 2K to 2,500 for a four bed in the area I invest in. Awesome. Congratulations. It's a nice big fatty, right? 25%. Can't beat that with a sharp stick. That's awesome. Good for you. Good for you. That's great. So Robert Farinelli, if I uh, tell me what um, the worst area means. Summersworth was voted the ugliest city in the state of New Hampshire three years in a row. I love investing there. I love it. It's absolutely awesome. There's, um, it's mainly because of the down, it's mainly because of the downtown area. That's what it's mainly from. That's what it's mainly from. Yep. Um, and so they actually hired somebody in the last year to literally drive around and take pictures of things and send, uh, send landlords love notes or even property owners, but send property owners love notes. That's what I call them saying, you got to take care of this. You got to take care of that. And then if not, they're going to find you. And so what was really interesting is, is I had been there for 11 or 12 years for investing. Um, I'd never gotten one. Never got, that's not true. I gotten one. I'd gotten one. And it was because a tenant um, decided to put in a dumpster um, and didn't, and it was one of those normal pickup dumpsters, but didn't put a fence in front of it. So from the street, you could see the dumpster. Uh, and so I got a letter about that. So I sent it to the tenant. I go, you can have the dumpster, but you got to close it in with a fence per their instruction. Or they're going to start fining. And he was like, oh, okay. And I was like, there you go. Um, and so then that's what happened. But then when they got that guy in his job, when they got the new guy in that job, oh, got crushed. I got like five letters in 60 days. I said to him, I go, did I do something wrong? <laughs> He goes, no, they're all really minor things, but they just need to be taken care of. And I was like, like there was a piece of fascia board missing. I was like, like, I know we're going to get to it, but we don't have like this immediate time frame for it. Yeah. Ironwood Workman, Lumberjack. When are you going to get a cabin in Montana? Probably never. Probably never. Beautiful state. Beautiful state. Um, but probably never. Ever since the big fight I had with Harrison, you know, we just don't spend nearly as much time together anymore. I still watch his movies though. Uh, My Serenity, I've had Section 8 ask me to lower rent uh, to tenants affordability. Have you had that happen to you and how do you deal with it? No. <laughs> no. Nope. No. And if they asked, I would say, actually, Appreciate the time. Glad you gave me a call. Wanted to let you know real quick that I'm raising the rent. That's because in all honesty, my serenity, my guess is that they are probably over budget and they're, they're doing a bad job at managing their funds. And I'm not going to make up for tomfoolery or shenanigans. Uh, they're going to have to figure it out. They got to run that. They got to run that office better. Those people do lose those jobs when they find that they can't house a number of tenants or that they're constantly getting vouchers that are expiring. Those directors of housing do get fired as well. They should. They're not doing their job. Their job is to take the number of vouchers they have, make sure they're fully deployed. And if they approve vouchers, then that means that they have vouchers available that they can pay for. That's what it means. And if you can't fill those, then you're bad at your job. Way it goes. Uh, I'm a workman. Oh, man. <laughs> You're the only one that got a joke, I bet. Harrison Ford lives in Montana, has like 1,000 or 1,100 acres or something crazy. Yeah, so I think that's awesome. Um, so I wouldn't buy a lot of cabin there. And believe it or not, the main reason for that is because I can get the same log cabin here in New Hampshire. Um, and we still, you know, you can still see the stars. You, the only thing we don't get is, uh, is bison. So I think we don't get, we get everything else. Um, G Lovell, my serenity. I've never heard of that. That's crazy. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be on the pound sand train too. 
I'd be like, no, we're not doing that. Not doing that. I'm not lowering rent for you. No, you're the government. You figure it out. You figure it out. You know how to print. You figure it out. I can't print my own money. You guys can. Yeah, I'm not lowering rent. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The only case that I would, the only, so here's what I would look at. And this is why the rent box is so important. The buy box is important when you're buying. The rent box is important always. When you're buying, when you are managing your property, when you are trying to fill it with tenants, when you are trying to justify the cost, the rent box is the most important thing. Do I have enough ice? Those are fake ice cubes. Yes. I like really cold drinks. Really cold. And so to answer your question, G Lava, if I can fill the ice up to here and it wouldn't spill every single time I took a drink, I would. <laughs> Is my glass big enough? Yeah. That's good. I have a bigger one. It's too heavy. <laughs> loaded with loaded with fluid, uh, liquid and and ice. Um, my serenity, how do you verify a voucher before showing a Section 8 tenant? Um, you can call the housing specialist. Um, if they should have given you their name, they don't have a voucher number, right? So it's not an actual number they get assigned. Um, but they say, Hey, I have a three bedroom voucher. What I would do is I would then call the housing authority and say, I had this tenant or this prospective tenant. They're interested in coming to look at the unit. I wanted to just verify that their voucher is current. Um, and that there's no evictions on, on their record. And they should tell you that. And most likely they will tell you that. Um, but that's what I do. That's what I do. Um, we, we allow anybody that we, we make, we have a pre-qualification to getting a view of the unit. So we want to see credit score. We want to see uh, proof of payment for rent. We want to see no evictions. Um, and we want to see pay stubs. If they can't provide pay stubs and they provide SSI, you know, social security, that that's fine. They can provide those too, but we want to see all of those things. Yeah. We want to see all those things. Uh, if they say, yeah, I've got a voucher say, great. All right. When's your lease up? You need to have those questions on the ready. Okay, cool. When's your lease up? And they're like, uh, I'm not really sure. Okay. But you're looking for a place. Yeah. I just hate the landlord. Okay. Those are the responses you want to hear out of them, right? If somebody's just legitimately saying, hey, yeah, you know, we got a bigger, we, we got a, a three bedroom voucher, uh, but we're in a two and we really just need the extra space um, or whatever it is. I had somebody that had uh, five kids, five kids under the age of 10. And she's like, yeah, you know, I've got, uh, I'd be willing to live in a two bedroom. No, 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 no. No way. No way. Uh-uh. Nope. That's ridiculous. That is a problem waiting to happen. Our workman, Matt, could you get into Pace Morby's club and use his for free? If he ever finds a place uh, in his last video, he was asking why everyone does not live like this. Uh, Matt, you could get into Pace Morby's club and use his for free. Uh, I don't, Pace Morby doesn't know I'm alive. No. Uh-uh. Um, and Pace Morby's awesome. He's the best. He's the best marketer. He's a brilliant businessman. Um, I think he's awesome. I think he's absolutely awesome. He did a phenomenal job of scale, uh, getting the right people. Like Pace is fun to watch. I do watch a good amount of his content. I really like him. I really like Pace. I hope I hope it all goes well for him. Uh, funny thing is, I kind of like Grant Cardone too. I just don't have the same feeling about Grant. I think that Pace has more staying power. Um, Let's see. REI Stoners, how does your exterminator deal with ants? Spray or something else? Have you dealt with ant hills under under the property? Not under. No, not that I know of anyway. Uh, yeah, he'll spray. He'll spray. We'll do traps. We'll usually do a combination of things. Ants haven't really been an issue here. Nope. Uh, Robert Farinelli, the worst area you were are talking about where your Section 8 tenant moved, I'm assuming Summersworth or Rochester. Oh, so she moved from Summersworth to Rochester. Yeah. Yep. I hate her. She was horrible. She was a horrible tenant. She was a horrible person. Every single tenant, like literally high-fived us. 
literally high fived us. Like one of them was literally like high five. I was like, for what? We hated that tenant. I go, really? Me too. <laughs> they were awful. They, she didn't have a job. She, all she did was sit around all day long and bitch about all of the neighbors. It was awful. Um, my serenity. Uh, what about first voucher holder? Will they have paperwork voucher in hand? No. So if, well, so if they have a voucher, they will have paperwork in hand. If they don't have paperwork in hand, they don't have a voucher. So that's where you should absolutely, my serenity, you're, you're thinking right on this. You should absolutely call section eight and they will have a record of that person having a voucher. They'll say, oh, she's on the list. Well, on the list doesn't mean anything. She might get offered, she might get a voucher in a month or six months or a year. On the list doesn't matter. What it has to be is I've gone, I've done my voucher briefing. They have they actually have a briefing where they give them the voucher and say, this is what you have and here's all the rules and here's how you use it, right? So you're thinking exactly right. Don't take their word for anything. Just follow up with housing. Make sure that they actually have the voucher in hand, not anything along the lines of, well, I'm just waiting to get approved. Nah, 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 nah. You're waiting to get the unit approved. We're not waiting for your approval to get your voucher. Ain't happening. Yep. Yep. Um, let's see. Ironware Workman. By the way, I have been to every state in the U.S. Nothing like Montana. Just saying, friend. Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. I've been to almost every state. And there's nothing like New Hampshire. Um, yeah, Montana's beautiful. Yeah, no, no argument here. No argument here whatsoever. For me, it's convenience. I don't get weeks of time off. At, at weeks of time off. I don't get that. I don't get that. I get usually days off at a time. And so it's a big trip, big trip. But yeah, I get it. I mean, Montana is the second most beautiful state in the country. Uh, Robert Farinelli, because I don't know if she could move to Manchester, but yeah. Oh no, she could. She could. She wants to, she wanted to stay more local. I mean, the numbers here are higher, so she could port her. You can port a voucher from one area to another. You can port. You can actually port it from one state to another. You can. Yep. There's a program for that. They can port from out of state. They can also port from uh, county to county or city to city. Um, but yeah, she wanted to stay local, sadly. I'm still going to see her. Uh, let's see. Keith Hager. Morning, morning, morning. No, new washing machine sump pump water faster than the one and three quarters stand pipe. It's supposed to be two inches. Um, get back to me in two days with their decision. They haven't reached back. Should I give them a call to follow up or move on? Oh, no, sorry. Duh. Wrong rest of the question. We have had uh, two flooded rentals with this problem. Fixed it with forced reducers and clamps. Um, what I've done is so technically plumbing code is two inches on a discharge pipe and it's usually an it's usually a uh, isolated pipe um but yes you can do reducers um you can also open up the pipe you know so literally it comes up from the floor usually um you can open up the pipe and you can go replace everything down where it connects down to the floor and make that two inches that way it's that much more that it's storing in in the actual pipe so you can do that as well so yes those are all options uh, Andy Borch. Hello, Matt. I have a great applicant who loved the house and said would get back to me in two days with their decision. They haven't reached back out. Should I give them a call to follow up or move on? Absolutely. Give a call to follow up. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, we had that on the building that we just posted and we then had two or three, literally the agent was like, oh man, they all, they loved it. They loved it. People are afraid of confrontation. People are afraid of telling you something you don't want to hear. So we always will give people a couple of days. If we haven't seen the application, then we send them a quick email. Hey, knew you were super interested. I uh, wanted to let you know it's still first come, first serve. Um, it hasn't rented yet, uh, but we wanted to make sure to give you that opportunity because you said you love the place so much. Uh, please let me know either way if you'd like to move forward. I had one person reach back out and said, here's the nine things I'd want you to do in the unit. Nope, pass. She's like, you're not willing to do those things for me to move in? Nope, pass. Well, that's rude. No, it's not. F off. You don't like my place. You want me to change a bunch of things. Those are all specific to you. Piss off. Go away. Bye. And then I rented it. 
three days later to somebody else that loves the place. Just as it is. Yeah. I had somebody else. What a tool bag. I will share this story. A teacher. My mom was a teacher. A teacher says, I just got a new job, but I don't make enough money, but I really want to live here. I need you to reduce the rent $400 a month. No, no, no. We said the, these are brand new units. They've just hit the market. I don't care. Let me help you out. I don't care. And since I've got the unit, you don't. Let me think of it. Uh, neener, neener, neener. Reduce it 400 bucks. Why? Because you're a teacher? No, sorry. Pass. We rent to cops. We rent to teachers. We went to firemen. We rent to everybody. You're going to have to pay. That's the way it goes. You can't afford it. Go find something else or go get on a program that can bridge the gap for you. Not doing that. Because you know what? Why is that fair? That building now consists of three small business owners and a nurse. They're all great people. They all love the place. They all deserve to live there because they love it and they can pay for it and they qualified for it. Yeah. People are, people are more than happy to get you to take less money for your things. Uh, my Serenity, have you had experience with bed bugs? Yes, twice in 22 years. They were both from acquired tenants um, and we were able to get them both done. Um, if you have to do that, I would strongly recommend uh, the heat treatment. They heated to, I think it's 128 degrees. Um, they basically shut all the windows, close all the doors, plastic, a bunch of stuff. And then they turn the heat up to literally 120 degrees and that kills them and all their babies and all their eggs. And so that's the way we've done it. That's the way we've done it in the past. Worked out really, really well. Both times killed the problem, killed the issue. Um, we did charge both tenants for those because the other units didn't have them. And a lot of people are like, well, you can't blame me. Watch this. Ask the inspector when they go in there, say, I need you to determine which unit was actually the cause. Because very rarely does one unit bring them in and then the bigger, and then a unit has, then another unit has a bigger problem. Usually over time. And that's what happens is one gets really infested. One gets sort of infested and one might not get anything or lightly infested. I still have to treat everything. So the heavy one is always the culprit per my exterminator, right? That's an awesome tip, but he'll actually write it in the report. We had a duplex where this horrible person that we talk about, um, the lower unit went vacant. She was there for two, three months by herself. She got rats. She was leaving her trash on a three season porch, like an idiot, like a moron, like a, like a doofus. She was doing that. Then she got rats. And then she's like, it's not my fault. Okay. Whose fault is it? You gave them a place to come feed and rats are always looking for food. You gave them a place to feed. They found your place with a bunch of food. And so they kept on coming back. And he's like, she's like, this is a problem. I was like, you're the problem. You caused it. But when I said to the inspector, the not this, I said to the city inspector, but I also said, said to the exterminator who on his inspection, I said, I need you to determine where the problem was. And he's like, Matt, it's a no brainer. It was absolutely 1000% her unit. The other unit was vacant and there was no food left behind. So the other unit was clean and vacant. I was like, so you're positive. It had nothing to do. He's like, no, had nothing to do with the other unit. It was hundred percent her fault. I said, cool. Can you just write that in a report, please? He's like, yeah, absolutely. So that's how that worked. That's how that worked. That's how that worked. Uh, Dave Mellick. Uh, do you remove large trees if they are hanging over a threatening neighbor's house? Uh, any tips on reducing removal costs? Um, we, we usually work with the neighbor. So I'm trying to think the last scenario. We had a tree that was over our property, also kind of over another property. And then down the hill, there was a property below us um, with tenant cars. So we just called them and said, hey, listen, this really should be removed. It's dead. It's going to create a problem for you. It's going to create a problem for them. It's going to create a problem for you. 
Um, in that particular case, all I asked them for was access because it was going to make the job a whole lot less expensive. So I got the job done for 1100 bucks instead of 3000 because they didn't need cranes and all this other stuff. Um, and because they, they could basically fall stuff because they blocked off the areas and they could fall stuff right where they, it was and then basically take it away. So I don't know that there's a better hack than that other than my usual hack of I always get three quotes. Unless it's with guys that I've done a ton of business with and I don't bother with three quotes until I feel something, oh, I was like, hmm, that, might, that feels like a little bit more expensive than what I paid in the past. And I asked them, is that more expensive? Like that feels like a lot more expensive. Yeah, but this, that, and the other. Okay, I understand. And then just on the next one, I'm going to quote it out. On the next one, I quote it out. That's that's how I do it. Um, Let's see. Buzztune. How does the grading work for neighborhoods? Is the great is that graded yearly? If a neighborhood is on an uptrend, when do you see uh, the grade adjust? So I assess the grade. That's where we have to learn our markets. So if I know that an area is, you know, like so, example as an example, uh, maybe a new hundred unit development is going in there, you know, with apartments and things like that. Um, usually those owners will have conversations with the city and say, we want this patrolled more often. Or if it's a real issue, they'll actually hire security there. Listen, people are not going to stick around where it's constantly patrolled by the cops. They don't want to get hassled. They want to go, they just go somewhere else where it's more quiet. Um, and so I grade it just looking at the area, you know, that's where for me, not investing, uh, at a distance, I check out my areas. I'm in my areas. It's a huge advantage to the strategy. I literally drive through my areas all the time. Never, never seems to be a problem. Um, and then if there does become a problem, then I talk to the police about it, you know? Um, but that's how I do it. And you can see an area improve in a year um, or also get worse in a year. But usually if it gets worse in a year, it's because of something happened in that area or something overall happened in the market. You know, like um, a big retailer left. And so now it's abandoned everything. And, you know, that's more of a problem now. Um, but yeah, that's that. So I don't, uh, I don't on purpose regrade every area. Uh, it's just more knowing your market and having the feel for, you know, as you've got, as you get experience going through that process. Uh, Josh Coster. Hey, Josh. Josh was in the uh, boot camp last night. We had a good time. Uh, how would you go about building a deck for less than retail? Great question. Great question. Um, I'd be looking for used material, not somebody that's built a deck before, but somebody that said, you know, hey, I was going to do my deck in tracks or was going to do it in PT. Everything got dropped off. You want to make sure that all the lumber is still straight, but they can say, hey, you know, I, I'm not going to build the deck because we decided to sell the house. We're not going to build a deck there or whatever reason, or maybe we're losing the house. Um, and then they're just looking to get that recovery. So I would look on like a Facebook marketplace or a Craigslist for some of the material. Um, you know, I've bought Trex that was six, seven bucks a linear foot. I've paid $3 a foot for it, you know, and it was like, there was no reason why I shouldn't, you know, they were, they were, they said, yeah, we had a big, huge deck project. We decided not to make it as big. And so we went a little bit smaller. Same thing with like, uh, I would look at the ads in the city, you know, 40 minutes away from me, 45 minutes away from me in Boston. And I would buy tile that they were putting in these multi-million dollar townhouses and guess what? They had an extra pallet left over. They're just like, yeah, sure. We'll sell you that. I was like, cool. And they're like, yeah, it's 23 bucks. A, I bought some sandstone that was 23 bucks a square foot. I paid $3 a square foot, paid 12 bucks a tile. And the tiles were, you know, almost a hundred bucks a tile because they were two foot by two foot. So I look for material like that. Absolutely. So that's the first way that I would go about it. The second way that I would go about it is, um, you know, looking on like a thumbtack and picking maybe a smaller company at a big, huge company, but getting three quotes. I would absolutely get three quotes. A lot of times when you get three quotes, you can find quickly the guy that's nervous about getting more work done. So long as his grades are good, right? I'm not going for the guy that's got two stars out of five because he can do it cheaper. Nope. I'm looking for the guy that's four or five stars that says, yep, I just had a job fail out. And that's the other thing that I would do. Third tip is when you talk to them, say, I don't have a deadline on this deck. All I want is a 60 to 90 day time frame when you're going to be able to do this deck. And so you can use it as a filler. 
Somebody doesn't show up, use it as a filler. Somebody um, cancels a job on you, use it to fill that space. Somebody in this, you know, in all those scenarios, and then they're like, wow, cool. So I don't have a deadline on when I have to do this thing, really. It's 90 days. That's fine. I can squeeze anything in in 90 days. Um, and I have a go-to job in case one of my other jobs falls apart. That's how I get big jobs done all the time. All the time. That's how I get big jobs done. You know, the other thing too is, is finding, you know, so let me know if that, if that, if, what do you think, what thoughts on some of those ideas, Josh? Uh, Chris Culp, any sense on when you will post your butcher block countertop video? Yes. Um, it's going to be in the next week or two. We figured out, I think we figured out um, the recording of that. And so, um, where was he doing? Oh yeah, I remember. Where, yeah. So yes, next where I hope that we get that video done this week. If not, it's going to be next week because we've got a couple of projects that we're just finishing up so we can bring them to market, but this one place needs counters and we're going to do the butcher blocks there. Uh, let's see. Ironwood Workman uh, at Dave. You could have the arborist get it yep, on the ground and then clean up the brush or wood both yourself. That's true. Yep. Also, the stump can be removed over time with pellets uh, and a drill. That's true. Um, so that is true. You could do it that way. Um, you can also look at what they'll charge to take it away. And then because that job is easier, you might be able to find a guy who's got insurance that is really good with a chainsaw and can come and just basically rip the thing up into pieces. And he's going to say, yeah, that's fine. I want the wood anyway. Right. A lot of times if it's in city though, they don't want it because people would stick signs and things like that. And the wood's basically useless. Um, so if it's in city, that's typically what you find. If it's in like more of a rural area, you have, you have a lot more luck with that. Um, but yeah, those are all good options for sure. Oh, uh, let's see. Joshua Melby, man, I have a tough time finding my spot. Some must've been something I said, 20 people just dropped off. Uh, Joshua Melby, uh, what's the best way you found to reduce the noise between floors? Uh, safe and sound, safe and sound rock wall. Uh, the other thing that you can do too, is you can do strapping, um, on the, on the, uh, joist heads. Um, and then when you put down flooring, just put down some sort of a quality pad. Um, the other thing that you can do too, is you can also add a product called quiet rock. You can add that to the ceiling. Um, and that will reduce your noise as well. Those are all options. Um, upstairs, we're doing a flooring with new LVP and the basement has a drop ceiling. Yep. Yeah. The way that you can do that is you can actually put some sort of a membrane on top of the drop ceiling, but yeah, it can be kind of a pain that's expensive and kind of a pain in the butt. Jordan Ham, have you ever not paid a contractor due to poor quality or taking too long? Uh, not taking too long. That's not true. Somebody, well, sort of. So somebody didn't finish the job and I gave them six months to finish the job and they didn't finish the job. And then a year and a half later, they were like, Hey, I'm going to come finish that for you. It's like, don't bother. It's done. What about your balance? Dude, you didn't finish the job. I had to go hire somebody else. And I spent more than what my balance was. Pound sand out a year and a half. Go away. Um, poor quality. No, I give them the chance to fix it. I want them to fix it. That's all. I just want you to fix it. And then if they can't fix it, then I would sue them. Um, if we couldn't come to an agreement, uh, but we've never really had that problem. We've, we've just stopped using that contractor. You know, it's like, okay, they got bad. Okay. We'll fix it. That's fine. And then we talk to them. And a lot of times it's just, I, I eat it. Um, because it doesn't really happen that often, but it has, I've, I've usually eaten it, uh, acquiring SK. Hey, SK. Uh, acquiring rental property with Section 8 tenant in it, paying 3100 rent with yearly lease ending October, end of 23. Okay, cool. Uh, FMR is HUD user shows 4100. Can I increase rent to FMR once I close? Um, you have to, a uh, couple, a bunch of things. A, you've got to talk to the housing specialist, number one, um, and say, these are my intentions. I'm going to raise it to this. Number two, it's obviously got to be within what FMR is or ballpark you know, thereabouts. Um, it can't be rent control. So you got to make sure that it, you're not breaking any rent control laws. Um, but that's where you need to have had a network and be talking to other people and say, Hey, have you guys rate, you know, how have you raise rents with housing? 
your network is your net worth. You want to be able to reach out to other people in your area and talk to them about the experience they have with that housing department. But on its face, 3,100 to 4,100 on its face. Yeah. You usually just have to look at the HAP contract, HAP, the housing, uh, housing authority, uh, um, paperwork. I can't remember what the P stands for, but yeah, the HAP contract, look at the HAP contract and it should say right in there what the policies are. Usually it's 60 days. So you could close, even though their lease ends at the end of the time, you can say, you can give 60 days notice and say, you know, I'm raising the rent to this, but again, you have to check and make sure that it's not a rent control area and all of those other things, all those other steps, but that's general guidance. But I would talk to the housing authority specialist. I would talk to them as part of that. I went workman. I ran a tree service in Seattle, Washington from 1988 to 2000 and did contract logging. Then Seattle changed. Yep. So I moved to Montana. Good for you. Good for you. It's gotten so much better there. <laughs> My serenity, how's the process for annual Section 8 rental increases? Do you email the housing authority and give a new lease annually? My serenity, watch the beginning of this video. I cover all of that. Spend about 25 minutes walking you through step by step. So it's all there. All right, sooners, I've painted for a week and still don't know karate. <laughs> nice. Paint the fence. Paint the fence. Paint the fence. That's the slow way to do it. Uh, Master Coach University. Hey, Master Coach. Our triplex has a general drain backup, all cast iron pipes. The plumber tells us it'll be 12K to rebuild the horizontal portion with PVC and that we can patchwork the vertical pipes over time. Okay. Does that sound like the only option? No. Why not just snake it and roll the dice? Um, cast iron, you'll likely break through the bottom in a lot of cases, but that's something that can be tested by hand. Um, there's no way it's 12,000 bucks. There's just no way. That number is ridiculous. Get it quoted by three or four people. That's not, there's no way. Nope. There's just no way that that's the number. That's an absolute gouge price. Yep. I saved you a fortune. That's, there's no way. I've just done it. I just did one. Um, what did it cost? 2,300 bucks, 2,500 bucks. Yeah, it's not bad. You can basically just secure and put hangers right on the downward pipe. You, you can put hangers on all of that. And then you figure out where you're going to connect. You're going to use probably likely a, a, a fern co, which is a rubber, you know, double or triple strap on that. Again, depending on what your laws are. Um, but in the most case that will fly. And then you're going to go right down into whatever your, your plumbing pipe is going to be, um, your uh, PVC. Um, it usually needs to be, most code is it needs to be a black pipe. It doesn't have to be, it can be black PVC. Some some say it's okay for it's, it to be white PVC. Um, but yeah, that number is absurd. That number is absolutely absurd. There's no way it will cost anywhere near 12,000 bucks. In fact, I'll do it for 12 grand. How about that? I'll do it for 11,999. I'll fly out there and I'll do it for you. Or I'll hire a plumber for you and get it done for you because it has to be a, a licensed person. There's no way it's 12 grand. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Is it in the slab? Is it like hidden in the slab? Yeah. Um, did you camera the line already? I would be cameraing that line first. That's what I would be doing. Very first thing I would do is camera the line. Yep. That's going to cost you two to 300 bucks. Camera the line, get a recording of it. See exactly what it is. Um, yeah. Yep. The answer. I, yeah. No, that guy's looking that that's ridiculous. 12,000 bucks. Ned talks. What's up, buddy. It's been forever. Ned talks. It's good to see you, pal. Hope you're doing awesome. Um, Scott Coleman, great info as always. You're welcome. Uh, for the teacher in distress, maybe she can contact her national union leader, Randy Weingarten. Uh, we know she will let her stay with her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, right. I know, right? What a bunch of crap. Yeah, no, and you just take less. Oh, I'm glad we've worked out with you spending my money. Sorry. The government already does that for me, so I'm not going to let you. Uh, what's up, Ned Talks? 
Um, yeah, lots doing. Uh, have you had experience with tree roots and cast iron sewer lines? Yes. Live in New Hampshire. Yep. Live on Sundays is typically during church. I get it. I totally get it. I understand. I understand. That's why I go extra long for you guys. For you, for, for the, for the God fearing folk that still need real estate information. And that's why I also record it for you. Um, so yeah, I've had plenty of experience with uh, tree roots in cast iron lines. Yep. Plenty, plenty, plenty. Um, sometimes it's called skirting. Um, and so usually they kind of look like capillaries. Uh, it gets very, very, very heavy. Um, and so it can create blockages. And so that honestly could be happening. What's happened to master coach MCU. Could be what's happening to Master Coach University. Could be what's happening there. You could have heavy skirting uh, further down the pipe, but you absolutely should not, should not. And hey, real Master Coach, you, you, um, have you had it scoped, Master Coach? Let me know. Tell me if you've had it scoped, um, Duchess. Have a two-year-old gas water heater. Got it. Pilot light won't stay on. Got it. Call for 400 for pilot light assembly. Got it. Looks highly based on my research. Anyway, 400 bucks for a water heater pilot light assembly. Reasonable. Uh, it's a little pricey. It's a little pricey, but if they're willing to show up, get it done, blah, 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 blah. Um, if it's only two years old and it should be covered, um, I would call the place that you bought it um, and I would do some research there. Um, but yeah, it not staying off. The problem is, is that they know under a warranty thing, they know that you need time is of the essence when that thing is not working. Um, but that's what I would do. I would look up the warranty. I'd call the 800 number and say, this is my model number. I have proof of payment, blah, blah, blah. That's why I save all those receipts like that, you know, with the big box stores, I have all those receipts in my email. So I literally can pull it out. So I have, you know, in my property management software, I see date and time that I did it. I can literally just go into my email and I can pull that. Document your unit. That's what I teach. Documenting your unit and how to do it. That means that you don't end up having to pay for that type of stuff, Duchess. Um, Master Coach, uh, pipe is underground and they said they just leave it underground. Yep. And build an entirely new PVC above ground. Yep. Uh, but they'd have to build it all the way to the street city line. Uh, Master Coach, we spent 40 minutes talking about this last night in my, in my boot camp. This literal exact same thing. This is what we spent 45 minutes talking, 40, 45 minutes talking about. Um, who was in the group last night? Yeah, you gotta you gotta scope it. Master coach, you gotta scope it. Everything stems from the from the scope. You might have a, a, a part of the line might be broken. And then when you excavate it, here's the thing: plumbing companies charge an absolute ass load of money to excavate. Don't do it that way. I find the guy, I call dig safe, dig safe comes out, marks all the lines. Then I call an excavator who might be 150 bucks an hour with his machine or 200 bucks an hour with his machine as an operator. And I pay him to dig it up. Yep. That's what I do. And then when I see what's there or they send me pictures of what's there, then I go, okay, that's the problem. But I have it scoped when I have it scoped and I, do the camera thing. I have a full recording and it shows the number of feet from that point where it is. That gives me a general indication within a foot or two where it is in the yard, i.e. the break or the problem or whatever it is or why it's getting hung up. It could be hung up because the pipes collapsed. It could be hung up because you have heavy tree skirting and one auger bit through there is going to clean it all up. They don't know. 12,000 bucks is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. The pictures, look at me on Instagram, Lumberjack Landlord on Instagram, that entire project that you see there cost me 6,000 bucks. I did a hundred foot line to a chimney through the street. And I did a 70 foot line to the chimney in the street. Chimney is where all the water accumulates from the sewer. That was 6,000 bucks. And that was digging up tar under sidewalks. Yeah, there's, I do not believe that $12,000 number is a complete and total ripoff. There's no way it's going to cost that much money. I would scope the line. And after you scope the line, when you find out where the problem is, 
then I would look at addressing tactically those problems because it could just be digging four feet down and cutting out a three foot section of pipe. It could be that easy. What PMs do I use? Jordan, give me more detail, my man. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Keith Hager, uh, we changed from city home inspector to contract out of state inspector. Uh, that sucked. No communication available on their time. 120 days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, isn't that awesome? A double signature page when the renters notarized letter from renter and landlord. Terrible. Yeah, and they wonder why they're going to lose units, right? It it will turn around. It'll change. Write a letter to the if, if that's FH if that's um section eight. Write a letter to the director, and then um, write a letter to the director of that housing authority, and then um, follow up on that. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll kill it. That'll kill it. That's horrible. SK, did the 2024s just get revealed? Yeah, I, I did a video on it. SK, come on. Did a video for you. Uh, given the 60 day notice that will, will pass the October 31, 2023 deadline for lease renew. You don't have to renew a lease. You can go month to month in most States. So you don't have to do a lease. Um, can I still talk to housing? Uh, not if you put them under lease, you can't. Nope. You you can't. Once you're in lease, that's the number for a year or whatever term you agree to. Yep. Master coach, they didn't scope it yet. Yeah, get it scoped. Two, 250, 300 bucks. Get it scoped, get it recorded. Make sure when you ask them about scoping it, that they can also record it. That's probably the new toy I'm going to get myself this year. I'm going to actually get one of those really expensive uh, line scopes because we do it for every house we buy and I'd like to get ahead of it on stuff that we already own. Josh Melby, do you typically paint your trim or use vinyl since you use white? I paint it. Uh, well, it depends on what it is. I figure vinyl is less maintenance, but so expensive. Um, outside. Yeah. We'll, we'll outside. We'll use the clear product, clear or Azac. We'll use some of that stuff. What we do is we buy it in sheets and then we cut it to size ourselves. That's usually what we do. Angel R. Hey, Matt. Hey, Angel. Uh, I have a 2014 gas water heater. Uh, that's still working fine. Do you think it'll be a good idea to replace it at the 10 year mark or wait it out? Thank you for your time. Um, next time you're looking at it, I would have it serviced and have them take a look at it. Um, if it's, you know, if you're starting to get corrosion around the, the, the pressure line, um, if you're starting to get corrosion around any of the different pieces or parts, if you're starting to see rusting on the bottom, cause that's what rusts out. And then you have a water, uh, then you have a huge water issue. Um, you look at my Instagram lumberjack landlord, you'll see that there was one on there where literally the heat core just basically went and water was dripping all over the igniter. And it was like, okay, this thing's shot. Um, but that's what I would do. I, I don't just necessarily replace them based on time because they, they are in a position where some of them maybe indoors, uh, maybe in a basement that doesn't go hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, there are factors, you know, usually the, the normal conditions in a basement, that thing's going to be dead. If it's an eight year tank, it's going to be dead in eight years and two months usually. Uh, but I would just look at that because usually you can tell before they're going to go because it gives you the signs that I was just talking about. It's usually the case. This one tenant, this one person next door, total asshole. Just absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. Keeps on, my guys are just trying to work through the weekend. They're trying to make extra money. That's all they're trying to do. And this guy, um, they're making noise. They're mudding and taping sheetrock. They're not making that much noise. And he knows not to contact me anymore because I gave him the what for. I was like, we're, we're doing things by the law. We can still absolutely be working. Um, let's see. Iron, we're working Matt. Uh, you can line uh, an iron pipe with plastic, right? Um, yeah, usually yes. But the, the issue isn't the, that it leaks. The issue is that usually the line's compromised. And so I've seen those go through the process. It's usually a lot more expensive and it's not nearly the fix. It's not nearly the fix. So I've never seen that work long-term. 
Yeah. Keith Hager. Uh, no, I did that one. Jordan Ham. Uh, property management system. I use dot. I use Door Loop. That's what I use. I use Door Loop. I love it. Lined. Yes, I got you. Thanks for all the super chats, everybody. Yes, thank you guys. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, Master Coach University. Yeah, get that thing viewed and get it recorded. It's likely going to tell you what the problem was. You could have something as simple as tree skirting that can be fixed. You know. Uh, so generally, you'd be comfortable with renting to three tenants, continuing to use 100-year-old cast iron, assuming drains right now. Yeah, absolutely. I do it every day. I do it 100. Most of my most of my cast iron isn't that new. Most of my stuff's older. Not joking. 1880, 1890, 1900, 1910, 1920. I don't know when it was put in, but I've got cast iron that's original to the house. And I can tell you 90% of my houses... The cast iron is still there. 90%. It's still there. Just, yeah, I'm telling you. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't, yeah, 100 year old for cast iron doesn't bother me. Nope, at all. Uh, Chris Cope, would you consider going month to month or shorter than term uh, new unknown section eight tenants? You can't. When you sign them on, they have to get a year. When you sign them on, they have to get a year. When you renew them, you usually, Section 8 wants another year. I can go month to month. I can just let my lease expire. I can still fill out the, I can still fill out the HAP. I can still fill out all that stuff, and, but I can bring them to month to month. That's what I've done in my state, done it a number of times. Um, and I've done that with people that have a lease that expired at the end of October. And I want to get the renewal, um, but I also want to get the bigger number. And so I've just said, yeah, I'm not going to renew it this time. But I let them know I'm going to raise your rent in January 1. They can start looking for another place and you might lose that tenant. It's possible. Um, but you'll get that new rate and then you can get that new tenant in there. And the other option is you lose a whole nother year. And in some of these cases, like you saw one, it was 500 bucks a month. That's $6,000 this year. I'm not going to lose 6,000 bucks in one month of it being vacant. And they, I know they need them in the system. I know they need more, more stuff. Uh, Ned talks. I just got like 30 to 40 zoning violations sent to me from the city with a court date and everything on a property. I don't own. That's some. <laughs> you know what you do though, Ned, you know, what you do? I swear to God, this is what I've done. I've gotten those before. And you know what I did? I called the owner and I let them know, Hey, here you go. Any interest in selling the building? <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I literally just did that uh, two weeks ago, uh, 10 days ago, sent the guy an email. I heard that his building was getting con uh, condemned. <laughs> yeah. I sent them an email. I said, Hey, um, it was somebody that I knew we'd, been, we'd talked a number of times before. I said, Hey, any interest in selling this building? Here it's back. Literally his answer was N O. It's <laughs> awesome. So now we'll see how he handles it being condemned and it's going to take him some time. He's going to put people up in hotel rooms and the whole nine yards. It's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, Joshua Milley, when you remodel, would you paint doors, old doors white and install new hardware or just replace? Um, I like to replace. I like to replace because most, most landlords put in crappy doors like the, the hollow cores. I like to replace with a nice, heavy Craftsman 3 door. It's in my course. I talk about that all the time. Um, but I show you all the different stuff that we use. But yeah, I want to go solid, heavy solid core door style that I like. And I like to swap out those, those door sets because they're usually wonky. They're the hollow core doors. Yeah. I usually swap out. Yep. SK, uh, after tenant moved out, if I had to spend 400 bucks to deep clean the house and garage to get it ready for new tenant to move in, can I deduct from a security deposit from the past tenant? Uh, you can, if you have proof that they got it in that condition. So if I, I, for on my units, I hire professional cleaners. So I can send that bill to the old tenant if I started them off with having it professionally cleaned because I have to get it back to the standard by which I gave it to them. And I can charge for that. Ned talks, all short-term rental violations. Ah, for, for my LLC. So it seems like maybe someone trying to use my LLC on their documents. Interesting. Looked up the addresses in question with zoning. They don't exist anymore. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, somebody's got some dicey stuff on their hands. Dicey. That's crazy. 
Um, all right, a couple more minutes, guys. 1.30, then I've been doing this for two hours and I'm going to go upstairs and spend some time with my kids and let my weekend begin. We did a long two and a half hour boot camp last night. Did a bunch of prep work yesterday. We did yard sailing, did a bunch of property stuff, trying to find out if my guys actually got kicked off the job for doing work. Bunch of jerks. These loser tenants, these loser tenants next door, like they own the place, you pinheads. Should have bought your building and evicted your dumb asses. Sadly, their building was too expensive. Otherwise, I would have bought it. This guy's been a thorn in my side since day one. All I did was get rid of the crack house that was next to him. What a jerk. This guy complains about the sunshine because it's too bright. Dear God. Pain in my ass. Dion, you have a week full of awesome. <clears throat> Dion, maybe alive tomorrow? Dion? In between naps? Maybe Diablo 4? Maybe? Maybe a little bit alive? Maybe? Got time tomorrow? Some time? Probably should take a day off. I don't know. I don't like that. Frank Contreras, welcome. SK, what number door lock do you recommend uh, to change the pin when new tenant moves in? What number door lock do you recommend? Yeah, I always change them when the new tenant moves in. Yep. We have a landlord code. Then we have um, four temporary codes for um, for maintenance people. When we have the unit and it's ours, we put a construction code in. Uh, and then that code disappears when we, we give it to a new tenant and then we just put their code in. That's usually what we do. Uh, Keith Hager, I have my vendors in a book of pages with multiple business cards with full pages titled plumbers, electrical, HVAC, concrete, lawn service, carpenters, brick block masons, vinyl installers, etc. It's awesome. SK, is buying a duplex in a commercial zone a pro or a con or better to be residential zone? Um, pros and cons, pros and cons. Yep. It ranges. It depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on a lot of stuff. It can be really valuable. Um, if the, you know, uh, building next door ever needs this, that, or the other, uh, and they're like, oh, we need parking. We'll buy your building and tear it down. Okay. You can get a ton of money for that. Um, I know I've done it. Um, so it, there's, it's just, it's not a pro or con out of the box. It's just understanding what that is. Uh, Buzztoon, when is the next boot camp registration? So we're filling up the next boot camp now. I think we've got out of, I think we've got like maybe five spots left in the next boot camp. Next boot camp will be uh, around the end of the year. Yep. Yep. We finished this boot camp. Uh, we finished this boot camp in October, beginning part of October. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do another boot camp towards the end of the year. Um, and then it will go for 12 weeks, but yeah, we've already got, I think it's, I think, I think we have six spots left. I think it's six. I have to look. Cause we also, if somebody couldn't attend the date and time that we did this one, we actually give them first right of refusal to get into the next one too. So I think we have, yeah, I think we have like six people that haven't, that have bought it, that couldn't attend it yet. And then I think we have nine or 10 already signed up. Um, that, are um, yeah, I, th yeah, I think we have like six spots left. I think that that number sounds right. Um, I would work when I get more time, I need to go to the boot camp. I, oh, yeah, I agree. I just hope I do not work myself to death first. Yeah. Don't do that. You'll have a lot of fun in the boot camp. I look forward to having you. Ned talks. I personally love commercial zone stuff. Yep. Give you flexibility in my, uh, opinion. Yep. But it sort of varies on zoning specifics and situation. Exactly. That's the only challenge that you get on the commercial side is zoning. Zoning can be a challenge sometimes. SK, sorry, I meant to ask, I, I meant to use ask a brand model of number. Oh, number lock you recommend to buy off state rental property. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I like the Defiant. I like the Defiant, but it's not web enabled. The reason I like that is I want it air gapped. I don't want somebody being able to hack it like that. Um and so, yes, I use a Defiant. It's like 42 or 45 bucks from Home Depot. Uh, we use that as a standard. We have a ton of them. Uh, we've deployed, I don't know, a couple hundred at this point. Yeah, probably a couple hundred. Yeah, a couple hundred. Yeah, love it. Scott Coleman, uh, the building that's getting condemned, is that the Department of Edu <laughs> Education? It's not. 
It's not, this guy actually is a slumlord. He's a slumlord. It's bad. If I bought the building, it needs 200 worth of work, but for the right price, it's worth it. So we kind of wait and see, but I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic week. I'm going to call it a day. Um, please make sure you hit the like on the way out. If you're contemplating or thinking about the course at all, just look at the syllabus. If any of those things are areas where you can get better, then the course will help you. Um, it's pretty action packed. You guys see what a lot of the guys put in the chats here. Um, Chris Culp and Robert Farinelli and Phil Neeland and Ned Talks. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people in this that are in the course as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an, it's an awesome opportunity to really learn REI stoners. They're in the course as well. Um, Josh Coster, he's in the course as well. He's actually in the boot camp as well. So is Chris Culp, uh, Robert Farinelli. He has graduated. Um, yeah, there's a lot of folks that are in the course that are here and, like I said, continues to be worth value and time. Uh, I think BuzzTune, I believe, might be in the course as well. Um, but yeah. Oh, Clint LeClaire, he took the course as well. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, lots of people in the course. But yeah, check out the syllabus. If any of that stuff can help you out, then that's what the course is there for. I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic uh, Labor Day weekend, um, the remainder of it, and a fantastic week in front of that. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely, as I always say, we try and create great content for you. Uh, we'd love it if you'd hit that like, um, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.